Welcome, everyone, to tonight's show. It is Sunday, May 15th. I'm Dimitri Alperovich, Chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, a geopolitical think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm joined tonight by Michael Kaufman, an expert on the Russian military and a research program director in the Russia Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis. And I'm very excited to have a new guest that I've been trying to get for, on the show for some time, Dara Masakot, a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, and formerly an analyst on Russian military cap- capabilities at the Department of Defense. Uh, Dara, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So let's begin with you, because you have a very unique perspective on this conflict, in part because uh, you were on maternity leave uh, for the first half of this war. And uh, unlike most of us, we're, we're not for quite understandable reasons glued to Telegram and watching all the videos. So you have a little bit of perspective uh, that we perhaps may be lacking being uh, so so in the weeds um, since February 24th. And what, what I would like to ask you to start um, this conversation is your perspective. You've been a longtime Russian military watch, watcher, of course. Why I think they've performed so poorly? Why have we misunderstood, miscalculated their capabilities so badly um, at the stage of the conflict? Well, thanks for asking that question. Um, I I would also note that uh, this is the this is my second baby, and it's also the second time um, that the Russians have invaded Ukraine while I've been on maternity leave. So uh, it's quite a coincidence. I wish they would stop doing that. Um, but taking that longer view and and watching it unfold and and not really being part of it um, while I was out, um, it it just it still boggles my mind that this was a war of choice for them and yet they're not prepared for it. They asked their military to do something that it was not structurally designed to do anymore. Uh, and just, just, you know, by any metric of, of military performance, they just, when, when you say, when you say that they weren't prepared for it, what do you mean exactly? Uh, I mean, a, a large scale ground uh, combat like this. This was what they were trying to move away from when they started their reform process, you know, all those years ago in 2008, 2009. Uh, but I guess, you know, the, the two things that strike out to me the most um, watching this, how did they get themselves into this place? I did not assume um, going in that they would um, hide from their own rank and file that they were going into combat. I still can't wrap my mind around it. I know that's what their system leads them to do. Uh, but how do you fundamentally shoot yourself in the foot like that before you even start? Uh, that, that's one side. That, that's a excessive secrecy. It's, it's part of their military culture. And then I think the other thing that has come into play here is, is such a faulty set of assumptions about how the Ukrainians were going to do um, in this conflict. Their, their campaign design from the beginning was stretching them too, too thin. Um, they threw basically all of their professional enlisted forces in the army and a few other services against this with, with no realistic plan for, for backup. And, and Mike has talked about their personnel problems extensively and, and he's spot on there. Um, you know, but I, I guess it's just, it's such a failure to anticipate other courses of action. Like, you know, would NATO or the United States be providing um, uh, such materiel support, such intelligence support to them? It, it seems like this was something that caught them off guard. And so I, I've just been surprised at, at the lack of, of planning and, and lack of thinking this through. So let me challenge you a little bit on that, because c- certainly the lack of planning, the lack of pre- uh, uh, preparing the force uh, for this invasion is there. But what strikes me and, and continues to surprise me as more and more videos come out is the lack of training and professionalism in the uh, uh, in, in the uh, volunteer um uh, force that we're seeing from on a daily basis. The Ukrainians just this week put out this video of this uh, young guy, 22-year-old Shalayev, uh, an officer in the 70th uh, Guards Unit, I believe. Um, uh, he's now a prisoner, and they confiscated his phone, and they released a documentary of his various videos that he had made um, up to a year prior to the war and, and leading into the war. And there's one particular uh, piece in the video that was just so striking when they're in the uh, armored vehicle driving up to a destroyed uh, armored personnel carrier on the road. And, and there's just there's no communication. There's no radioing for help. 
assistance, asking what's going on. They're literally just observing the fact that, you know, one of the Conrads has been blown up on the road uh, and they're not even thinking that, wait a second, maybe they'll be blown up as well. I mean, what do you make of that, of just how unprepared they are for war? So I, I feel like we could do a entire podcast just on that video. Um, for everybody, it's called Occupant or Occupant. It's a short 20-minute um, documentary taken, I assume, from the cell phone of a lieutenant um, who is now a POW uh, inside Ukraine. And you know, it's heavily edited. I mean, they're, they're, telling, they're telling a story with it. But anyway, but you can see inside the barracks, you know, the, all the money that was spent on uh, providing a better quality of life for these soldiers and making sure that they had like nice furnishings. You see him buying a bicycle for his daughter. They live in a comfortable apartment. All of these things track with all the money that they've spent and what they've been trying to do. But then the video cuts forward and he's inside Ukraine. And, you know, just as you were talking about, he comes up on this burnt out column. I mean, it's still smoking. Um, the Ukrainians had probably shelled it, you know, within an hour. And, you know, there's not an impulse by the lieutenant or anybody else inside that vehicle. I want to say it was an MTOB or something like that. But their their impulse was not to radio for help. Maybe they were told not to. But there was no impulse that we could see from the video to make an attempt to see if there were survivors or people wanted to come with them. Was anybody wounded? It, I mean, it was, you know, the, the response was, oh, you know, well, it, there were many Russian like curse words, which I'm not going to repeat, but it was basically like, wow, that's bad. We got to get out of here. And, and they just drive on. And I think about, I think about that, that these are small units that are essentially trying to survive inside Ukraine. Um, there's not a significant amount of unit cohesion that's being displayed, even to casualties within the same unit. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's surprising to me in some ways. I mean, I'm, I'm still like processing this in real time, but it speaks to this trust relationship that is broken throughout multiple levels of this command chain. When you don't tell soldiers in Belarus uh, that we know from the accounts that they're telling to their mothers and their wives, you know, that they're going to war until the night before, what kind of trust do you have uh, when you're inside a combat zone? I mean, you essentially have a force on one side the Ukrainian side that is highly motivated and a national survival, personal survival uh, on one side. And then you have a Russian force. And I don't know how pervasive it is across the different units, but certainly multiple of them who are just trying to survive in small groups. That's not a particularly high will to fight. But, but Dar, uh, you know, I get that the plan was bad. I get that the, the, the morale is awful. But still, at some point, if you have a professional force, your training takes over, right? And you've seen so many of these occasions. You you saw this uh, back in the Battle of Kiev where they're driving into Kiev with this force all bunched up, uh, you know, and just primed for artillery targeting, taking them out. You've you've seen the disaster, and we'll talk more about this uh, with with Mike in a second here, about the river crossings that they've attempted to do. Uh, It just seems like, you know, they're completely untrained as, as, as a professional military. And I don't know what they were doing for the last year as they were getting ready to, to invade. Uh, the preparation started, uh, you know, over a year ago. Um, but even beyond that, just, you know, what do they do day to day in the military that makes them um, uh, essentially commit these really, really basic mistakes that, you know, someone in the U.S. military after six weeks of basic training would not do. Yeah, so I, I think it's really uneven. So there's certain things that we can see them doing where they're executing a, ta- a complicated task with some proficiency. So, you know, not every artillery barrage that they do is, you know, into a field. Sometimes they are quite accurate at what they're aiming at. Um, there's some thought applied into their targeting strategy for their longer range precision guided munitions. So, you know, you can see them, they're not necessarily bad drivers, they're driving in new terrain, they've never been in personally, they're, they're able to handle their vehicles. But then, you know, you have these, you know, as you were saying, just basic, basic gaffes that, you you know, that really draw into question what's going on within the, the, pro, the training programs within the garrison. One thing that strikes, uh, that I remember, because they were posted within a few days of one another, was an example of a... Um, small Russian squad, maybe a platoon, uh, 
um, going across a bridge. And they were all walking together, clumped up, you know, they just totally disorganized. No one was paying attention to the environment. And they start taking fire, I think small arms fire, and they just, you know, kind of disintegrate. They drop to the ground. Some people run. I mean, it was just very chaotic and very unorganized. And then within a few days later, you see a similar Ukrainian-sized unit moving through, um, and they are they are spaced appropriately. They have uh, good gun discipline. There's people who are assigned to, to provide cover for different directions. It was just really striking to me that there's that there's such a problem going on at the smallest levels. One other question that really puzzles me is we, we, we've known for years, for decades, that the Russians are really good at electronic warfare. They're really good at signals intelligence and, and other technical means of, of intelligence collection. Where's all that? I mean, you're seeing Ukrainians achieve remarkable success in their targeting, both artillery targeting and other um, ambushes that they've executed. Some of it we now know from the press uh, is is being done with the help of the United States, obviously, which which is a massive force multiplier for the Ukrainians. But you know the Russians, we thought uh, were quite capable at this as well, and we're just not seeing the results of that on the battlefield. W- what do you make of that? So you know that that was something that surprised me as well. Why we weren't seeing uh, you know more targeted cyber attacks at a very large level, and by that I mean you know cyber attacks or AW. To the point where, you know, the electrical grid grid was being affected, where, you know, cities or parts of cities were being plunged into darkness deliberately. You you didn't really see that. Um, I I think it's important here also to, you know, maybe modify the the narrative here a bit. Uh, There are accounts from Ukrainian soldiers themselves that the Russians at a local, at different local levels, were targeting their comms. So they're probably, they're, as in there was some EW that was happening. And they spoke uh, very positively about the effects that Starlink has gotten, um, has done for them. It's able, they're able to communicate when they didn't have other means to do so. So I don't want to say that you know, Starlink saved the Ukrainian army, but it certainly was something that the Russians were not anticipating that kind of support coming in. But I think there is a larger problem too. Uh, it's just not as pervasive, I think, as some of the assessments were um, leading to be. But but even just on Starlink, I would have expected them to be able to identify the terminals that are being used. And we know that most of the terminals are used by either military or other VIPs within the Ukrainian government and to start targeting those um, uh, signal uh, locations kinetically. And they haven't even done that. And we know that they have the technical proficiency to do so. I've just been surprised at that. But Mike, let me bring you in. I mean, Dara mentioned something that was interesting, that they've never really had the force structure or the design since the reforms of 2008 to do an invasion like that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, generally, I think that we've actually, we knew some things about Russian force structure and choices made uh resultant of thinking on military strategy and the kind of wars they plan to fight and how they plan to fight them but there are also some things we learn about russian force structure that i don't think we quite knew until this war started so you know the russian military had gone with a tiered readiness force that was meant to be flexible and to be able to generate sort of an x percentage of combat power that was going to be staffed uh by enlisted professionals and also then try to build out a much larger force structure, you know, divisions and the like that uh, would be, you know, partially manned. And, and the, in the event of a larger war with NATO, they expected that there would be a degree of mobilization so that they could raise manning levels and fill them out. And the challenge they got themselves into is that over time, they kept building out larger formations like divisions. The overall size of the force wasn't expanding. They weren't able to get additional uh, enlisted contract servicemen. So they kept spreading, you know, to use an analogy, kind of butter over more and more bread, right? And so eventually the readiness, I think, went down across a lot of formations to around 70%. And here they got themselves into issues. So uh, first, the way they kind of configured the force, particularly the ground force, uh, there was a lot of Russian military thinking and debate, and I'll summarize it this way, that sort of strategic ground defenses were a thing of the Cold War and that the Russian military wasn't going to focus on having a lot of density and mass and it wouldn't need a lot of manpower to occupy and hold down terrain, nor would it need a lot of logistics 
even though it's a firepower heavy military, they just weren't planning to be doing big ground offensives. And the units really focused on building out maneuver formations with fire and strike, uh, various enabler support, uh, means of ISR. And so over time, they kept cutting down the infantry in their units. And I'm writing something on this with Rob Lee right now because he's done a lot of digging into the subject. So the amount of infantry kept shrinking, kept shrinking and shrinking in uh, Russian formations and then battalion tactical groups as well. And there was little light infantry in the Russian military. In fact, you'll probably see maybe, this is argumentative, but the best performing part of the Russian military force on the whole has probably been the naval infantry across these uh, uh, different battles in Ukraine. So what does this this all shake out to? First, uh, the Russian military really assumed they would not have to be doing big ground offensives and would not require a lot of manpower. And it was thrown into Ukraine to actually conduct a ground offensive along three different fronts and at least five, six axes of advance without the logistics or necessarily the manpower to hold terrain. Second, well, it's hard to do combined arms if you actually don't have a lot of infantry because they don't have infantry to support tanks and tanks don't have infantry to support in cities. And, oh, you actually need a lot of infantry for urban warfare. So how are you going to fight for big cities without infantry? Uh, third, this begins to explain why we didn't see much infantry getting out of Russian BMPs, out of infantry fighting vehicles. They had very little dismounted infantry. And a large part of that was by design. And uh, the other part of it wasn't, which is what happens if you have a tiered readiness force? The readiness is reduced. But then over time, as people maybe struggle to make some of their contract servicemen figures, they fudge the numbers and their actual readiness is maybe a bit lower than people expected. Yeah. And so we find out that there are issues in the Russian military, maybe along the same time that they find out that they have issues as they don't quite have as many as many troops at that readiness level as they'd expected. So uh, here's the truth. First, the BTGs that people were counting around seven to 900 personnel on average. They're quite smaller. They're on average 600 personnel. Okay. So the original force that went into Ukraine in terms of offensive maneuver formations, if you look at end strength, it is quite smaller than people thought back on. So we, we estimated that, that we estimated based on these battalion tactical group numbers, there was at 190,000. So you're saying it was actually quite a bit lower than that. No, no, whoa, 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 we didn't estimate that, and 190,000 number is something somebody put out from the IC as the total force involved in Ukraine. People get their numbers really confused in this conversation, and uh, and that wasn't a we. <laughs> so that's an official figure from somebody, and you have no idea what they were counting. Um, the, the honest take, I think, is that they have somewhere between 125 and 130 BTGs, not including the two separatist army corps, which maybe, you know, I'd throw a dart, say maybe another 15,000 troops, and the various Rose Guardian and Chechen units. But the long story short is that these BTGs were quite smaller and they were non standard. As one might be very large, one might be very small, and the range was very substantial, easily maybe 400 to 900 personnel size. So, it, At this stage, BDGs are actually a completely useless measure of Russian uh, military strength in this fight because they're all glued together fragments and you don't really know what's in them. Um, What kind of happened in the force really is they they built it around with some assumptions. The hedge they built into the force assumed that Russian leadership would declare a state of war for a large conflict, and they would have time to conduct partial mobilization raise manning levels. Obviously, that didn't happen because it was it was being fought as a special operation. So they're trying to fight this war with peacetime strength, and all the uh, active force uh, components have already been deployed, and everything that was left has already been used for reinforcements. Oh, and there's no units left in the back to rotate because you sort of assume that you're going to deploy a percentage of your military's you know, active force. And then over time, you'll be able to rotate them off the line and replace them with other units. Except the Russian military won't really be able to do that because there's nobody left that's not deployed or has been deployed and been mauled and is now combat and effective trying to trying to get replenished uh, back uh, back at their home units. Yeah, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but I hope that's enough. I hope that's enough of a... Uh... <laughs> Well, let, let me just follow up with this, Mike. Uh, about a month ago on this show, you said that uh, 
you know, we may have incorrectly assumed that the Russians are, ten, are 12 feet tall and uh, they clearly aren't, but they aren't four feet tall either, as a lot of people are rushing to assume. Do you still hold that view? Do you still think that they have some formidable capabilities if it came to sort of the traditional fight with NATO that they um, typically think about um, as they, as they um, uh, define their doctrine and, and do their training? I don't, well, I don't know like what the base of that question. I mean, right now, while everybody's fighting in the war in Ukraine or five years from now or, or before this war started? Well, be, before the war started, I guess, in terms of what we now know about the state of their forces. Yeah, I mean, that force was actually built out to fight NATO. I think we now know for a fact that it definitely may not have performed nearly as well as uh, we would have credit. And that's a good thing because it's always preferable to, to overestimate than to underestimate. I think the big things that were missed really is that the Russian military would have, would have struggled tremendously in scaling operations, that the things that they could do with small force employment, uh, limited expedition operations, they really struggled to scale when they attempted something of this size. But there are a lot of aspects of this war that are context-specific, right? Why Dmitry always discouraged people from uh, overly generalizing and just not appreciating that military power doesn't exist in the abstract. It is not measured. It is pretty context-specific. There's some things you can learn that you can see the Russian military definitely gets wrong or or is very much undercooked. But uh, the the... The general, the popular take you will see is, oh, these, these, this military is now four feet tall. And that's the wrong, that's the wrong takeaway to make. Although, now that a lot of the Russian military uh, has taken these losses in Ukraine, it's definitely be, it'll definitely take years for them to recover, both uh, in material and more importantly in terms of the force and manpower. But on the other hand, it'll be interesting to see what kind of changes or reforms they make based on this experience, because these experiences often do shock. A, a military community and do generate change. Not always, but but oftentimes they do. D- Dara, do you agree with that, that they're not four feet tall and that they're more formidable than you, you might uh, assume reading Twitter commentary from uh, various uh, military analysts and, and uh, wannabe military analysts? Yeah, so, so Twitter is not a neutral environment, um, for sure. Uh, it is... There is an information war that is absolutely raging right now, um, and it is um, heavily favoring Ukraine. They are, are really, really ahead of the Russians on this this front here. So when you when you look through social media, um, it you know the Ukrainians are um, you know absolutely lethal with everything they do, and and the Russians um, beclown themselves on a daily basis, and you know it it is it is heavily skewed. Um, I don't know what the actual reality on the ground is. Um, I suspect that it is a little different. Um, But by and large, you know, I think the thing that we should consider moving forward is, you know, there is a lot of rot that is exposed with an operation of this size that the Russians could perhaps paper over um, and gloss over and why you didn't see these kind of mistakes happening in a conflict like Syria. That force size that is in Syria, even at its peak, is a very small percentage um, of of their military. I mean, single digits. And, you know, this is this is a huge lift for them. This is a huge lift. So you can't hide these things. You can't hide that, you know, to make your professional enlisted quota for the year or the six month process, you had to pressure conscripts to sign up. You had to coerce them to sign up. You know, there there's not a a document somewhere that exists of, you know, here's all the fuel that we siphoned away and and sold it, you know, like there's all these little hidden corruption factors. Um, And the point I'm driving at here is I think that there were some things that happened on the battlefield in Ukraine that were a surprise to the general staff themselves, Um, whether it was something like Mike was saying, where the personnel numbers were fudged and all of a sudden you didn't have enough tank crews or you didn't have enough logisticians to support such and such unit Um, to things like, you know, equipment serviceability. How many of my tanks work to does everybody have a a full fuel drum here today? Oh, yeah, sure we do, boss. Sure we do. And then all of a sudden the, you know, the convoy comes to a halt grinding somewhere in the middle of a forest. So. You know, there's things that can only be revealed when you try to do a lift like this. And, and now it's all exposed. Um, I guess I'm 
less pessimistic. I'm, I'm pessimistic that military leadership, at least the ones sitting in the chair right now, are going to be able to reform from this. Because unlike in Georgia in 2008, when it was something that surprised them, they were embarrassed by their performance in many ways, um, they could blame it, and they did blame it, on having uh, not having enough modern equipment, uh, not having a command and control structure that could help them, not having uh, sufficient training, things that were still stuck you know, in the 21st century and the Soviet period. None of those things you, you can really say are, are the problem or the primary problem here in Ukraine. They have modern equipment. It's perfectly modernized equipment that is being abandoned in fields. You know, they have the communications pathways. They just, for some reason, opted not to create a operational commander until six weeks into the war instead of six weeks at least prior to the war. So the problem is, is them. The problem is the decision makers and the decisions themselves. And it's really a lot harder to have that conversation with yourself. And I think particularly if you're Sergei Shoigu and Grasimov, you have shown in the last 10 years that you are not really receptive to that kind of critique or self-critique. So I, I, uh, I don't think they'll do it internally. I think it would have to be forced upon them. So let me let me follow up on that, because you're a longtime Gerasimov watcher. And in fact, you had a Twitter thread a few weeks ago talking about how Gerasimov actually has a lot of combat experience going all the way back to Chechnya and obviously Georgia and Syria as, as a general staff, uh, a head of the general staff. Um, we, we know that Putin kept amazing level of secrecy about the fact that he was going to war. Uh, we can infer that much of his security council uh, was surprised when he launched this operation. But there's no way that Gerasimov and Shoigu didn't know, right? They clearly were in the loop from the early days and had time to plan and prepare for this. So why Gerasimov in particular do you think has performed so poorly, given that he has so much combat experience, and given that he has seen the disaster of Chechnya one, and Mike actually uh, used this line on a number of occasions that it's the uh, Pavel Grachov, the, the guy that was in charge of the Chechen war back in the in the nineties, uh, has been resurrected to run this campaign because they're making the exact same mistakes that they had made back then, driving armored columns with no infantry support into cities, getting destroyed, and so forth. Why is this guy, Gerasimov, who should know better, presumably because of all his experience, has done so poorly? So, you know, I've, I've watched him for a long time. And, you know, he, the public persona that he has, he is an avatar. He doesn't really give you much to work with. He has the same expression. He's very circumspect. He does not go off script. I mean, he never has. Uh, in 10 years. And in my, in my opinion, he probably has a few times, but you know, I I've seen him smile very rarely. Um, I going into this, um, you know, I'll say be... this. I mean, Russians rarely smile as a rule. So that's not I surprising. I know, I know, but you know, he's, he, his, you know, public faces, you know, he's not going to give anything up. Um, but you know, that was, that was something that I, I grappled with in the weeks ahead of this invasion, just looking at the chessboard getting set. I just, I could not believe as a field commander who went through Chechnya and how poorly that they were set up for that and, and how many of people in his command um, were sent into situations where they were killed or wounded horribly, um, how he could look at a plan like this on paper and go, this, this will work. Um, I, I still wrestle with it. I honestly do. Um, so there's a couple different outcomes here. He looked at the plan and assumed the Ukrainians would, would not fight and that resistance would be minimal. It was still not a, a particularly great plan. Um, he looked at the plan, thought that it wasn't good, um, voiced those concerns at great personal risk and was overruled. Or um, because he is overruled by Putin, by Shoigu, yeah, uh, but one or both of them. Hmm. Um, and or the option three uh, was that he knew it was bad. But, you know, he's been in that system long enough to know where you don't say anything. Um, I, I don't know which one it was, uh, but it's it's been surprising to me. It's been disappointing, I suppose, for someone of his experience to, to not see the, the flaws here. Mike, do or, you, act, you, or act upon the flaws either. Yeah, Mike, do you want to add anything here? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would say one, it's hard to know if it's uh, the military. They just didn't really report its weaknesses and challenges and, and was hoping that uh, that they would be able to pull it off. Or alternatively, a lot of times it, the military does actually say all the problems and list the risks and it's the political leadership that just doesn't want to listen and is sort of fervently in belief that this political gambit can uh, can be pulled off. I, I suspect it might have been more the latter in this case, but it'll take time to find out. I think, Mitri, what I want to have the conversation, um, and I'm in full agreement with Dar's points, I probably should say cards on the table. Dar and I are longtime colleagues and friends working in the field. But uh, the first thing, it is impossible to overstate how significant the actual framing of the operation was and the fact that most troops didn't know until 24 hours before they were sent in. Because it meant that a lot of things like logistics, uh, the actual preparations for it really weren't set up. Things like command and control, things like, you know, whether it's pulling crypto for comms, there's all sorts of things that may have gone wrong, all the way down to commanders who may have had lower readiness than they wanted to admit, not having the time to adapt and adjust and figure out their own personal issues, sorting all that out in advance. And that in the first week, Russian troops really went in driving administratively down roads like they were still in Russia, assuming that they weren't going to have much of a fight. So very much misled. And morale really tanked because a lot of the best troops were, you know, lost early on in uh, these fights. And it became clear how terribly everything was organized. And so you have, in my view, low morale in general. It's not necessarily because Russian troops don't want to fight in this war. It's because they see, I think they, they, they think they see how terribly everything is organized in that in the actual battle space and and the, the they're clearly losing and you know the truth is that a competent force with pretty good logistics or in the case of the united states great logistics and great air power can often compensate for a durable plan and obviously the russian military isn't that force but you know as i have in the past i take issue with the way you frame some of the opening comments and and i'll put it this way first that narrative about uh, a, everything being terrible is orally spun. It creates a big input-output problem because if all that's true, you you would expect to see major routes, big unit surrenders, and this, that, and other, and you're just not seeing that in this war. Actually, probably the, the retreats of withdrawal by Russian forces on the more competent aspects of their operation. But the second one is there's a lot of comments that start off with, we see this and we don't see that. Well, see it where? On TikTok and Twitter? Uh, that's not necessarily the real war. There's a lot of things you wouldn't see, and there's a lot of things we don't know. We should be very honest about them. Uh, what is the basis for some of these judgments? Like, probably I see a lot of proclamations about the airport, air war and air campaign. There's very little open source available information about how that's gone. It does take a lot of time to actually dig out what took place, why it might have happened, and uh, folks really got to be careful with some of these proclamations and, and some of these announcements that people make. Basically, sorry, not announcements, but the, the categorical way in which people frame this discussion on Twitter. But you have a lot of people in, in this conversation who, uh, uh, I'll put this politely, I had previously not known to be in the field of Russian military analysis until the day after this war began, making very offering very strong opinions about how everything is gone which is usually impossible to discern in the first weeks or months of a conflict. That, that's certainly fair. But but let me let me challenge you a little bit on that, because certainly the lack of preparedness, the lack of uh, telling the troops that they're going into war can explain partly the failures in the initial phase of the conflict, the, the loss of the Battle of Kiev and so forth. But in the second phase, and, and let, let's dive into it, uh, for the Donbass, that's clearly not the case. The troops that are going into this fight know they're going into war. They know what their objectives are with regards to the takeover of the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblasts. Uh, they had time to regroup, and yet they're still performing quite poorly, as witnessed just this week with this uh, disaster of a river crossing in uh, Severny Donetsk. Uh, uh, how do you explain that, Mike? Okay, well, let me ask you, um, what's the correlation of forces in this offensive right now since it began? And how do you assess this incredibly poor performance? So the correlation of force on the ground between these two forces is probably closer to one to one with the Russian military having a considerable advantage in artillery but and fires. But now they basically glued together a lot of unit fragments after pretty high level of losses in the first phase of the war. And they're attacking Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian positions, which 
are probably ranging from well fortified to reasonably prepared positions that they have time to set up. So you would be expecting a pretty low rate of advance and you have huge natural obstacles like a river, like the Sversky Donetsk River. And so you have an attempted river crossing that they tried to do by uh, Shapirovka this past week that everybody I think has seen on Twitter. And it's more than one because it's clear they had at least a secondary one as a feint. And they lost something around two BTGs in this attempt at crossing. A river, you know, crossing a river. Which is huge, right? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty big loss in terms of material. Um, so, he, I mean, I mean, you want to say it's huge, but like out of, out of, out of what size force? Let me, let, let, let me go on my story. Um, everything is huge on Twitter. Uh, so this loss is pretty significant, but the important part of it is that they were clearly trying to encircle Sierra Donetsk. And they had an axis of advance from Papasna, and it was clearly somebody's ideas, idea to make this river crossing in order to try to create at least an envelopment, right? And to basically push these forces along the river. And it failed because it was repelled. And you can see that they have, even though they have a lot of abandoned vehicles and mobility kills, that they probably lost somewhere maybe north of 80 vehicles, right? And maybe several hundred troops in, in that. Um, so it's a pretty significant... Uh, loss from my point of view, but more importantly, is the strategic implications of that loss of that attempted crossing for the offensive, which, which is very fair, Dmitry, but that's also pretty much the hardest kind of ground force operation you can attempt against a very significant opposing force with a lot, with still a substantial amount of artillery and increasingly air support, because you've seen Ukrainian Air Force come back into this fight in the past week on the front that probably haven't seen in, in quite, quite some time. So, so uh, let me ask you the same question that I asked Dara earlier, Mike. Where is their intelligence score? You know, we, we know the U.S. is providing intelligence to the Ukrainians. We know that that's a massive advantage. But the Russians aren't dummies in this field either. And they just seem to be completely blindsided, even with this river crossing, not understanding that the Ukrainians have advanced knowledge, not understanding that they've zeroed in their artillery to that place where they're going to execute the crossing and they're going straight into it and, and failing. And we have seen that time and time again, where they get surprised by Ukrainian counterattacks, Ukrainian counteroffensives. Why is their intelligence so bad here? And is that a question to me, Dmitry? Because it feels like yeah. you like answered your own question in the way you framed it. <laughs> no, it is to you. I mean, we know the Ukrainians well, are good. It's not a question, it's a help. statement you made. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you don't agree. Okay, well, well challenge me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a statement you made. I'm guessing on the base of a composite of TikTok and Twitter. I mean, how do we know? Like, I'm just being honest with you. It's it's an opposed river crossing is a very risky operation, right? So most likely what's not bad is their intelligence because they clearly had several feints that they tried to make as well. What's bad is that they attempted a high-risk operation and they're still attempting high-risk operations, right? With what little force availability they have left. And that's just poor command judgment, right? But I'm asking you, how do you know what you know? Well, I mean, it's a good question. Obviously, yeah. we don't, but, you know. Okay, let's let's at, say that first. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. There's a lot we don't know. Um, caveat uh, taken. But uh, at the same time, you sort of look at the outcomes of a lot of these battles and the Ukrainians, from what we can observe, and, you know, we understand that it's limited, seem to have an intelligence advantage here. Can I, can I jump yeah. in? Yeah, yeah, please do, Darren. Dar. Um, so, you know, going into this when, you know, it was published months ago uh, before the invasion itself, you know, when there were the big maps all over Ukraine, here's how the Russians are going to go in from Belarus and they're going to come in all these ways. Um, you know, that was pre-bunking, you know, the, the administration has, has been upfront about that. Like we were putting this out, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, if you're Moscow and you're seeing that splash across the Washington Post or, you know, many other multiple outlets who covered it globally, uh, you know, do you, do you have the conversation with yourself thinking, well, you know, someone has someone's figured this out. Someone has access to our plans. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should change how we're doing it. This seems problematic, but they didn't. <laughs> if they had that conversation, it didn't lead anywhere because then they just continued on. And so, you know, I, I think about that at the macro level, and then I think about what that means at the tactical level. So, you know, I, I was there uh, when it was Russia versus Ukraine in 2014, and that was a different dynamic. Uh, 
And now we're seeing this, you know, dynamic play out and it's a little bit differently. So, you know, why, why is Russia having all these losses? Why are they keep getting surprised by Ukrainian counteroffensives? Why, why don't the Russians, you know, why aren't they better? Why, why can't they match the ISR? Well, because, you know, it would appear from the various disclosures that have been in the press in the last month or so that, you know, the, and, and officials going on record saying that the intelligence sharing right now is at unprecedented levels. Um, you know, the, it's not exactly one-on-one here. So, um, you know, and as Mike said, this is a very difficult thing to do on a good day. Um, I, I think that there are some tippers going on um, that are, are tipping the scales a little bit uh, for Ukraine. But, but again, I mean, let me just follow up on that, Dara. That explains why the Ukrainians are good. It doesn't explain why the Russians appear to be bad. That is also true. Um, so, you know, about about that river crossing, um it is it's suspected from for some of the forensic work that you know people are doing here on twitter it's amazing stuff that that unit was the 74th uh, motorized rifle brigade um from Kamerovo or virga mountain siberia and uh that's one of that's one of russia's best ground forces units um i'm a little biased against you know learning about that i'm biased you know in terms of that unit's history that was one of the first units i really got to know when i started my career uh, they've been in a lot of combat situations. Um, so I think it speaks to the importance of this access uh, for Russia and then how they need it to go well. Um, it, it did not go well for that unit. Mike, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the 35th, 35th was there too, but definitely a lot of it was 74th. And uh, my sense of it is that probably a couple of weeks ago when Gerasimo was there, he told him to shift the weight of the fence of east towards Sever Donetsk. And they were probably pretty unhappy with the lack of progress they had been making up until that point. And the fight's been pretty, pretty, uh, pretty intense around Severodonetsk as well. Um, and that likely they attempted this as a high risk operation to try to create a real axis of advance to the north. They're still making some gains around Iman, some small towns here and there. And there's a bit of a an axis of advance southeast from Azum, but in part they've abandoned. Uh, from my point of view, at least in part, abandoned the Zoom access. And so my best guess is that they attempted this high-risk uh, crossing because senior leadership really wanted to see progress. Um, and it was a gambit that uh, went very poorly. For Russian military, is a real culture of sort of leaning into these sort of high-risk, high-reward uh, type of operations and uh, made themselves pretty vulnerable to Ukrainian artillery. Although it's still hard to, it's hard to say what happened uh, at both crossings. Some of that might have been an actual straight-up mechanized fight as well. Um, uh, long story short. Uh, and we, we're seeing videos now that the Ukrainians are putting out that the new artillery, the new howitzers from the U.S. may have played a big role here, the M777s uh, that, that they apparently zoomed in on those positions at the crossing, right? I oh, mean, yeah, I've I've seen those videos. Maybe maybe they were involved, but um, as always, I don't know. when I was looking at the the images, to me, I don't know if you guys feel the same. It almost seems like there's like there was a missile or something that was lobbed at it. I don't know. It just seems like there's a, a lot of there's like an explosive explosive area that seems like not as consistent with artillery fire. But then you can see all these artillery pock marks, you know, going across the bridge itself and the ground around it i i don't know what happened there yeah a lot of the kit looked abandoned um to be honest with you so i i suspect that parts of the units got trapped on the southern side of the crossing and and still unclear what number if there are of any russian units are south of the river at this stage uh, i still have a number of friends and colleagues that uh, are digging into that to try to figure out the details of what happened. Why I'm often a bit reticent to talk, Mitri, is it takes time to figure out what really took place. No, you, you, you've always been very careful on that. Let me let me ask about where this is going. Uh, so, Mike, you, you've been um, pretty open both on this show and on War on the Rocks podcast with our friend Ryan Evans that you think that this can go on for some time. Um, there are different opinions on this. Uh, you know, our colleague on Twitter, Jomini of the West, um, Elias, talks about how this may go on for three to four weeks before the Russians really run out of steam in terms of this new offensive. 
Um, at what point do you think they're going to need to rotate these units out? And as you yourself have mentioned, Mike, uh, they don't really necessarily have the replacements. Yeah. So, of course, with these things, very difficult to predict. Obviously, if they keep trying to do uh, river crossing and, and uh, wiping out entire BTGs, the offensive won't last uh, very long at all. But that being said, um, you know, I also don't think the Russian military is going to uh, melt away or going to routes or easily retreat either. Where you see big gains made, for example, around Kharkiv, where the Ukrainian military is very successful to counteroffensive. The Russian military conducted an extended tactical retreat because they didn't have the forces to defend. And so um, that that territory was in many ways quickly uh, given away. But I think uh, in, in a lot of these areas, even if this offensive culminates, it won't be that easy. It won't be quite that easy so like, to push the Russian military back from it. Their biggest challenge is is still kind of more medium to long term. Uh, in peacetime force strength, they do not have the forces to sustain this fight. Okay, they've taken way too much attrition in the first phase of the war for that military's force structure, and uh, their attempts to raise manning by hiring people into contract service behind the scenes are kind of a piecemeal solution. And of course, they're trying all these different piecemeal solutions right now to avoid making politically difficult decisions. But that's just kicking the can down the road, and it's ensuring that what is already kind of a strategic defeat for Russia could become a very visible battlefield battlefield defeat as well, for a very basic reason. The more time they spend not figuring out what they're actually going to do with their force and how they're going to rotate these units and who's going to replace them and what the future holds maybe after this, this offensive, which is already running out of steam, the more they're going to eat in what's, into what's left of their force structure, the components and the parts that they would actually need to train up conscripts and to take in additional units. Because over time, they're going to end up having to go and pilfer officers and, and uh, NCOs from what's left of the force. And then eventually their capacity to, uh, to properly train and equip will be diminished. So that they're actually going to degrade uh, any, any chance of effectively raising manning levels down the line. So this is kind of the, my summary of, of, the, of the problems they face. And right now it just looks like Russian political leadership um, is, is, I don't know what a good term for it, it's just dithering and, and it remains undecided, uh, even as the situation to me looks profoundly unsustainable for them. D- Dara, where do you see things going? Well, I mean, I, I agree with Mike on the personnel front. I mean, they, if they were really going to try to generate a force that would provide some proper relief to a force size uh, like this, then mobilization should have happened months ago. And, and they just, they're not doing it um, other than these little piecemeal band-aid attempts. I mean, it's not going very well. The, these, these guys in many cases are older. They've been out of the fight for a long time. They're being captured or killed. You know, the Ukrainians are putting it out. On social media, uh, you know, the manpower is one issue. The the attrition is another issue. Um, you know, I, if you if you go back to you know Russian military strategy and how they think about attrition and loss, you know, a unit in the army is considered disorganized when it's at ten to ten to twelve percent of its original strength. You know, it, 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 it's lost ten percent of its strength in combat. Um, it essentially can do no more um, when it gets to fifty percent attrition of its uh, initial power and so if you i don't know what that looks like in aggregate like what is the what is the score for all the btgs in ukraine right now you know what is what is their calculator their calculator tell them you know when we lose x btgs uh you know our forces we've reached culmination that's it i'm i'm sure they have that number i don't know what it is um you know, and I, what do, what do they do then? How do they stall for time? And I was reading something by ISW. They just put out, I think yesterday, um, that we should all grapple and now and prepare for how they can buy that time. And one of those methods to do that is essentially to declare that they are going to annex into Russia um, the parts of Ukraine that, that, that they hold right now. So like Kherson, Donetsk, and Luhansk, and then you know, just not even, I think in Kherson, they're talking about not even having an election now. 
um, and just and just declaring it. So um, yeah, so I found that very interesting, and particularly yeah. the North Ossetia referendum that has now yeah. been called for June, mid June, yes. and it seems to me that they've now decided in the Kremlin that having these independent statelets like South Ossetia, DNR, LNR, maybe even Abkhazia and Transnistria. Uh, is no longer useful, and let's just go ahead and expand the empire and bring all those territories back into Russia. But what do you think that that means for Ukraine itself? If Kherson is yeah. incorporated into Russia with or without a referendum, uh, Mike and I have talked on a number of shows that the Russian position there is quite precarious, right? And the Ukrainians mm-hmm. could potentially launch a counteroffensive to retake that. If it's now Russian territory, as self-declared, um, do you think that that triggers a nuclear deterrent conversation in the Kremlin um, that we're now being attacked in Russia itself, as 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 they would self-declare with this annexation, or do you think that nothing really would change on the ground for that? Well, I mean, that if you look at Crimea as a case study, I mean, as soon as they declared it part of Russia, it was you know subject to protection for you know the Russian nuclear umbrella. So. You know, that could be a situation again where they're going to try to declare this um, in Ukraine. And then, you know, what what does Kiev do? And, you know, what do uh, what does NATO do? What does the United States do um, in terms of its support um, on on territory that Russia is going to treat like Russia? You know, the United States does not accept Crimea as Russian. But if you look at our de facto actions um, around it, you know, it's the case could be made that I don't know the case can be made, but it's uh, these are these are questions that probably need to be answered in like the immediate term, like in the next couple weeks. What do we do if we wake up tomorrow and these things are folded in uh, to Russia? Mike, do you think annexation changes a lot from a Russian response perspective to Ukrainian counterattacks? Hmm. I, I don't think so. I mean, one of the biggest questions I would have is how do they intend to defend it and consolidate control there? That would then be their next challenge. And uh, you know, as the war would then perhaps flip with the Russian military doing the bulk of uh, defensive operations, I could think it'd be quite challenging for them given how stretched they are to try to hold on to that territory. I can see a number of areas where Ukrainians could counterattack and make gains. And um, as, as I mentioned earlier, having not made some of these big decisions in terms of sustainability of a war, right? Because, look, conventional conflicts beyond the initial operation often over time come down to attrition. You know, lots of folks come up with fancy concepts to get around the problem of attrition, but manpower material, uh, can really dictate things. And so given they've not invested in their ability to sustain the war, whereas on the Ukrainian side of the equation, you have a lot of mobilized manpower and you have access to conventional equipment from the United States and other Western countries, and you have growing access to ammunition, you know, the military balance, the trajectory of it just favors Ukraine over time. If you just kind of hypothetically play this conflict out into, into the medium term. So I think that's going to be the biggest issue for them. Whether they annex the territory, they don't annex the territory. They still have to find a way to to defend uh, territory they want to hold under one political status or another. But but uh, you you don't think that they're going to use the nuclear deterrence to try to defend those uh, newly annexed territories? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of caveats and sort of, sort of let's put this way. it all depends. I mean, uh, we've we've discussed this before, and I've said that. I, I definitely see a possibility down the line where uh, nuclear weapons aren't just threatened the way they have been uh, doing in the past two months, but they actually try to employ nuclear weapon made for demonstration purposes. But that's, that's a whole separate conversation. I mean, you, look, you, you have to have a logical sequence of events that gets you from that to nuclear weapons. You know, nature, you can't just be, you know, you can't just make these intellectual leaps. Right. I, but, you know, let's let just hypoth- hypothetically assume that Kherson is going to get annexed and that the Ukrainians launch a successful counterattack uh, against, uh, you know, the um, uh, uh, the uh, the city and force the Russians across the river, across the Dnieper River. You know, do the Russians then respond with a nuclear weapon in, in that circumstance, given that it's 
would technically be, in their view, Russian territory. I mean, I personally doubt it. I suspect they'd have to just retreat across the river and blow the bridges and use the Dnieper as a natural defensive line. In fact, you know, a while ago when I wrote a thread on sort of what I thought was happening in this offensive, I suggested that one of the two main areas they would struggle to hold would be Kherson City because the cordon they've established around the city is pretty easily collapsible. They don't have a lot of forces there, and a Ukrainian ground offensive could could force them to bottle up inside the city and then get and then get pushed out of it across the river. That's actually a distinct possibility later on in this war. All right, last question for you both. Same question: uh, If the Russians uh, Russian offensive in the Donbas falters and stalls, do you think that we're going to see a a retreat like we had seen in the Battle of Kiev and now in the Battle of Kharkiv, where the Russians, maybe in an orderly fashion, just uh, uh, basically uh, vac- vacate the territory that they've taken and, and go back to February 24 lines um, or something similar um, and, and the entire front collapses? Or do you think it's going to be more of holding some of the territory that they've taken and it's going to be challenging for the Ukrainians to take it back? Uh, I, I know I'm asking for predictions here. I know it's hard to predict. And I know, Mike, you're going to say it's contingent. But what do you think is more likely? Mike, we'll start with you, and then same question to Dara. It's contingent. Um, no, but in all seriousness, I I doubt we're going to see the kind of retreat we saw from uh, Kiev. I think that's probably unlikely, and there might actually be an operational pause in general because I suspect the Ukrainian military would need time to bring up reserves in order to conduct an offensive. Um, it depends on you know, what the military balance looks like on the ground there. The the truth is that probably the Russian offensive has largely stalled out already. It just hasn't culminated yet. And the Ukrainian military is doing a good job of exhausting Russian forces. But something you have to keep in mind is that it also imposes a significant amount of attrition on the Ukrainian side as well, right? We don't see what's really going on with the Ukrainian military, and they're pretty tight-lipped about their losses, but they're not small. Um, and I get that from a lot of different sources and, and anecdotal evidence. So the notion that as soon as it stops, the Ukrainian military will in, in, immediately be able to launch offensives across a large line, that's probably also unlikely. And people should have realistic expectations about that, about the fact that the, there's not going to be any stalemate, but there's going to be a roving battlefield with territory changing. And there might even be an operational pause for some time for the Ukrainian military to build up before conducting an offensive. I don't know necessarily what the Russian military is going to do after that. I suppose their first plan will be to try to hold on to what they have taken, but it all depends on whether or not they're given the forces to actually do that. Dara, what do you think? Oh, predicting the future. Oh, um, you know, I, I don't see where else that they can, you know, if, if things go poorly for them moving forward, I don't see how they, there's any more lines of attack that they can retreat from. I mean, they've, they've abandoned the Kiev objective and it looks like Kharkiv is in progress um, as they return those forces home to Russia and, and repair them to potentially recommit them. So a few years ago, um, we had done at RAND some analysis on what it would take um, essentially for Russia to have Luhansk and Donetsk and I think a little bit of Kharkiv. And I think we came up with a force size of seventy to 80,000 troops for a wave one, and then you would need additional um, for holding. Um, that is a number that is possible and doable and is probably pretty close to where they are right now. Uh, but so. but did, you, did you account for the massive Western support, both in weaponry, training, and intelligence that the Ukrainians mm-hmm. are receiving? No, no, I did not. So, um, you know, the, the future here is, is uncertain. But again, uh, if, if those objectives were important to them, um, a larger a larger piece of territory than the Donbass, then they would have had to have already resolved this manpower problem uh, weeks, months ago, and they're choosing not to do it. So I don't know if that's because they have a different point of view on the future, um, looking at the variables that they have in front of them, um, or you know they're just going to try to muddle through this. But as as Mike pointed out, their their options are are narrowing as they they go forward here. All right, so I lied. So there's one more question <laughs> that you just triggered uh, with your answer, uh, I put out 
a thread a few weeks ago about how part of their future planning may be the idea that they can basically strangle the Ukrainian economy as they're doing today with a blockade of the Black Sea and shutting off most of the exports um, um, from the Ukrainian economy, agricultural exports, metallurgical exports and and other industrial products. um, And the railroads really can't compensate for that. So it's really critical for the Ukrainians to reopen the ports on the Black Sea to be able to resume most of their economic activities. Do you think that there is anything, uh, we'll go to you, Dara, first, and and then maybe to to Mike, anything that can be done um, in the medium to long term, obviously probably nothing in the short term, for the Ukrainians to really uh, break this blockade um, that the Russians are instituting right now with their both surface fleet of the Black Sea, the submarines, um, air forces, and coastal batteries in Crimea, Um, You know, the Neptunes obviously have limited range, Uh, you know, thinking outside the box, anything that can be done, you know, maybe provision of Mark 41 uh, land shore tomahawks to the Ukrainians to be able to hit the um, uh, Russian ships at longer range, anything along those lines that uh, might be useful, do you think? I'm going to punt that one over to Mike. I think this is his area, but I would just say in short, there's, they don't, not on their own. They don't have anything on their own um, really that's going to turn the tide of that. They have been able to use Neptunes. They are using um, tactical aviation pretty well. I thought they had a creative um, approach um, operationally uh, to what they did against the Moskva, but uh, breaking a blockade is, is another matter. Mike, I mean, the Ukrainian economy has collapsed uh, by something on the order of 45 to 50 percent GDP, or is collapsing this year. Anything that, that can be done in the mid to long term to break this blockade? Well, the blockade is principally a commercial blockade. It, it would be one thing if it was a naval if it was a naval blockade in the sense that Ukraine had a navy and was being blockaded. But the issue is really maritime commerce. That's very different because you can you can sustain a blockade like that via many different means and no anti-ship missile is going to solve the problem because you can't, you're not going to find anyone to insure a commercial vessel to go to the port of Odessa. So to me, the fastest solution is to... Well, you could, I mean, the the Ukrainian state could insure it potentially, right? NATO could insure it. There's, there's ways to to get insurance from state parties versus commercial parties. Yeah, but Russians could just sink the ship. How many ships do they have to sink before people stop traveling there? Um, the the solution to me in practice is much simpler. You reroute uh, what import and, and exports you can via rail to other European ports. Your closest ones would be Romania, and you might have to look further down. So you have to basically reroute the logistics. It might be inconvenient. Here I'm speaking beyond my area of knowledge, right? So you have to be very honest because I'm not neither an expert on uh, commercial logistics in Europe. Uh, or, was, or was feasible, but at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff goes to the port by rail and gets loaded onto ships, and if it could get out of Ukraine some other way by rail, which is still pretty functional, and go to you know some other capable port that has the bandwidth to handle that traffic or can expand to have the bandwidth, then that could be an interim solution. Yeah, I've looked into that pretty deeply. There's just no good solutions there. The rail traffic is already at capacity. Um with their neighbors, there's an issue with a different gauge that the Ukrainians are using versus most of their neighbors like Poland and Romania and others. Yep. So um, I don't think that there's any short term solutions or even medium term solutions there that are going to compensate for the massive um, capacity that you have uh, in the ports, not to mention that um, overland shipping is uh, several orders of magnitude more expensive. But at any rate, uh, thank you so much for another fantastic conversation, Dara. Thank you so much for joining us. Really fascinating perspective from you. And Mike, as always, uh, terrific uh, insights. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great night and appreciate you coming to this uh, show. Thanks, Mary. Good time, Dara. Thanks. Bye, Bye guys.